My name is Philip Henry Sheridan. I wanted to talk with you this evening uh, a little bit about my early life and uh, my escapades during the Civil War. So let me begin with a little controversy. I was born in Albany, New York to John and Mary Sheridan. My parents, John and Mary, came from County Cavan in Ireland, and they had traveled to Canada, uh, entering in New Brunswick, <clears throat> and made their way down uh, into New York at Albany. I uh, um, was born there, and uh, I was there was a little controversy about my birth. The controversy is surrounded by the fact that I don't have any birth records there. And so the suspicion is that I was either born in Ireland or born on the boat ride over. So according to my mother, and I always listened to what my mother said, she said I was born in Albany. So I'm going to believe my mother. I do have some siblings. I have um, uh, one of uh, five children. I'm the third in line. Uh, I have an older brother, Patrick. Um, I had an older uh, sister named uh, Rose. Unfortunately, she passed away on the boat ride over from Ireland. I have some younger siblings. I have uh, Mary, I have uh, John, and I have um, Michael. Um, we stayed in Albany for a very short time uh, before moving to Somerset, Ohio. There wasn't a lot of work uh, to be had in Albany. And my father, uh, being a contractor himself, got himself a job on the National Highway uh, near our, the town of uh, Somerset, where I grew up. <clears throat> in growing up, uh, my mother told me that I was always interested in the army since I was able to work. I, I don't remember any of that, but like I said, I always believed my mother. So uh, I do remember that I did have an interest in, in the army and the military in general as a young boy. Um, my first interest that I can recall was one 4th of July weekend uh, at the 4th of July festivities, they brought in an a Revolutionary War veteran uh, that I got to meet. And I was just enthralled with this, this person and couldn't see and get enough of him. Um, and at another time, I saw a, mil a, a West Point cadet. Uh, his name happened to be uh, William Tecumseh Sherman. You might have heard that. And he uh, and my family uh, were friends, and he would, began dating a woman uh, that we were also friends with as well, uh, Ellen Ewing. And so I, I used to see him come courting Ellen and, uh, in his cadet uniform and thought how wonderful he looked in that uniform, and I wanted to wear it as well. Um, unfortunately, I... Um, I should say, fortunately, I did go to, to school, and uh, but I, I just completed the mandatory schooling, um, not going any, any further than that, and primarily because I had to uh, go to work to help support the family. My father lost the contract uh, that he had, and, and so we were a little bit in uh, some financial uh, straits, and so I thought that I would help out the family. And I worked in uh, several general stores in Somerset. Uh, the first one that I worked at was John Talbot's store for uh, $24 a year. And then not long after, I uh, went uh, to uh, David Whitehead's store where I worked for $60 a year. Uh, John Talbot tried to counter off of that, but he couldn't, he couldn't meet out of the $60 a year salary that I was going to get. And then um, not long after that, my brother Patrick, who was also working at a general store named Think and Dittos, 
uh, swayed the owner to hire me there, uh, which they did. And I was now making $120 a year. And not only was I working retail there, but uh, the owner uh, taught me bookkeeping. So I learned how to keep books in that store as well. So moving on, um, I was a little antsy and uh, was reading the newspaper one day and saw that there was uh, an open appointment to West Point. And knowing the congressman from the area who used to visit the store, Thomas Ritchie, I wrote a letter to him uh, asking for him to um, recommend me as the, the appointment. And uh, unfortunately, I wasn't the fir his first choice. Uh, he had recommended someone else, but that person didn't pass the entrance exam. So um, I got the appointment. However, I didn't have a lot of schooling behind me. And so I needed to get some teachers to tutor me and um, in algebra as well as some other, some other subject matter, enough so that I was able to enter uh, West Point and, and pass the examination. My time at West Point, I entered in 1848. I was the class of 1852, but that didn't happen um, as planned. Uh, when I was a uh, junior in, at West Point, a cadet sergeant uh, was uh, telling me that I was, wasn't dressed correctly in line. And I didn't like that because I thought that I was. And of course, my temper got the best of me. And I thrust my bayonet out. Uh, he went to report me and the incident to the superintendent, which happened to be a, a gentleman by the name of Robert E. Lee at the time. And fortunately for me, I was not expelled. I rather he suspended me for a year. And so I uh, went back home, uh, went back to work at Think and Ditto's again, um, and uh, waited out my, my year. Um, I went returned to West Point, had enough, uh, I should say. I just barely had enough demerits to allow me to pass. Um, I, was, I had demerits, but um, not enough to flunk. So anyway, I did manage to graduate uh, 34th in a class of 52 in 1853. And so I was transferred as a brevet second lieutenant to the 1st Infantry in Fort Duncan, Texas. I was there for about six months when I was transferred to Fort Redding in California and promoted to second lieutenant. One of the uh, people that I relieved there was a former West Point classmate of mine. His name was John Bell Hood. You might have heard that name. Also, uh, after about four years at Fort Redding, I was transferred again uh, to the Oregon Territory at Fort Yamu. And I was there for three years. And that is when, about when uh, the war broke out. And it was 1861, and I waited orders to be transferred. I wanted not to remain in, in uh, the Indian Territory. I wanted to go and be part of this war. However, I had to wait for my replacement. And my first replacement was a gentleman by the name of James Archer. Um, I knew of Archer's southern leanings, and so I refused to turn the fort over to him and waited until another replacement came. Uh, in May of 1861, I finally got a replacement and was given orders to report to Jefferson Barracks in St. Louis. 
I reported to Henry Halleck directly, who gave me a task to clean up the books of his predecessor, John C. Freeman. And so I did. He apparently found out that I had some bookkeeping experience from my time working in general stores in Somerset. So I examined the books and found that there was a fair amount of legitimate activities that Fremont did. However, some weren't real legitimate, let's say. So I cleaned up the books and Alec then rewarded me with a position of being chief commissary officer for the Army of Southwest Missouri under General Samuel Curtis. I felt though that I wanted a little bit more than being a commissary officer, so I pleaded with him to take on the quartermaster's position as well. I told him that not only would I be able to supply and equip the army, but I'd be able to transport it too, having full control. He granted me that, and so I was promoted to a captain and reported to General Curtis. However, during this time, I realized that some of the Union soldiers were stealing horses and selling them back to the Army. And so they came to me demanding money for these stolen horses, and I refused to pay them. So they reported me to Curtis, and Curtis demanded that I pay these men. And I told Curtis that there is no authority that would allow me to steal or jail, and I refused to pay. Curtis put me under arrest and was going to court-martial me, but I sent word to Halleck what was happening. So Halleck came to my rescue, and he relieved me from Curtis's staff and sent me on a horse-buying mission in Michigan. Shortly after that, I was signed to an assistant to a, a topographical engineer under Halleck's staff. And so I worked with him and learned a little bit more, more than what I learned in West Point about topography, studying maps, roads, uh, and um, different uh, um, topographical elements on a map. Uh, which came in handy in my later years. I worked for him for a while. Uh, however, I didn't like, I wasn't satisfied with being a staff officer. I wanted to fight, I wanted action. And so I um, had contacted my old friend from Ohio, William Tecumseh Sherman, and he tried to secure a regiment from Ohio. However, uh, the governor of Ohio had someone else in mind and gave it to him. Um, at about that time, the governor of Michigan was in need of a colonel for one of his cavalry regiments. And my name came up and he, because he wanted someone from the regular army, and I was, so he gave me the position of um, colonel in the 2nd Michigan Regiment uh, Cavalry. So I had now uh, not only my first command, but I had a promotion to be Colonel in the regular army. Shortly after Shiloh, the Union Army uh, wanted to uh, take control of Corinth, Mississippi, which was a major railroad hub. And so they were planning on a siege of the town. And uh, P.T. Uh, Beauregard was occupying the town, but um, didn't have a chance to uh, have a siege as Beauregard had evacuated the town. I was given the assignment to go beyond the town to the south and guard the southern uh, entranceways to the town, in which my regiment did. Uh, however, I was given another regiment, uh, the 2nd Iowa Cavalry, and um, there, from that point on, I was in charge of now a, a 
small brigade. So we went south of um, Corinth to a town called Boonville and uh, sent out uh, skirmishers to the south of Boonville and uh, had a line, a defensive line drawn to the south of that town. Our skirmishers encountered uh, Richard Chalmers, uh, the Confederacy, and had a brisk fight holding them off. Uh, we had uh, Colt repeating rifles, so we could do quick work with them, uh, firing much faster than the Confederates could. And so the skirmishers pulled back to uh, our defensive position just south of the town of Boonville. And um, confronted the Confederates there. Uh, we held off uh, an attack and they tried to get around our left flank, but having previously looked over the maps of the area, I saw that there was a dirt lane that led through this wo the woods to our right and that lane reached around to the rear of the Confederates. So I had sent several companies of the second Michigan and a couple companies from the Iowa Cavalry uh, to uh, go onto that lane and get into the rear, but not to attack until they heard the main force attack uh, the center of the uh, Confederate Army. <clears throat> so when they did, we we attacked uh, their center as and the um, the uh, detached cavalry companies had. Uh, gone around and, and hit their rear at the same time. Uh, we were very fortunate on our coordination there and pushed the Confederates back and we chased them for about four miles until uh, they reached the swamp in which uh, we stopped and, and pulled back. It was about that time that General Rosecrans of the Army of the Cumberland noticed my actions there and wrote a letter to General Halleck, who was now in Washington City, and requested that brigadiers are scarce, good ones scarcer, and he requested the promotion of me to brigadier general. Halleck agreed with that, and I was then promoted to brigadier general, and um, not only just the brigadier general, but in charge of a division. Uh, I was assigned then to the 3rd Corps, um, 11th Division under uh, Charles Gilbert. Um, we were assigned to General uh, Don Buell Carlos's uh, uh, army uh, and in Kentucky because we heard that Bragg was coming into Kentucky as well. So we left Louisville and arrived at a place called Perryville, uh, where the battle there actually began um, as fight over water. Uh, as many of the Civil War battles were fought around waterways, um, the same was the, uh, here at, at uh, Perryville. We, um, my division, uh, wanted to obtain control of the Doctor's Creek. And so a brigade of mine uh, went across and uh, encountered Confederates there. Uh, they fought off the Confederates and my division then moved ahead and pushed the Confederates off. Uh, we had control of the Creek at that point. However, I received word uh, from my commander to pull back because, uh, I'm sorry, um, Don uh, Buell Carlos had, um, want, didn't want to have an engagement until early in the morning, and he didn't want to have any full engagements until then. So I was ordered to pull back. So I pulled back to Peters Hill and basically sat out the battle uh, on Peters Hill, not really getting into any further action because the majority of the action that took place took place well off to my left, out, out of my view. And that's basically how Perryville ended for me. From uh, Perryville, uh, 
our army moved to Nashville and under a new commander by the name of uh, Rosecrans. And uh, however, Halleck and uh, Lincoln didn't like Rosecrans sitting in Nashville and wanted to push him uh, into actions. So he eventually um, pushed his way from Nashville towards Murfreesboro, where Braxton Bragg's army was uh, was positioned there, and they were positioned there to prevent us from eating off uh, the land in Tennessee and also preventing us from approaching Chattanooga. Our plan was uh, to confront the Confederates, but Rosecrans didn't quite know where they were. So he sent out three wings to try to find the Confederates. And in short time, they were found. We formed a battle line. And the next morning, Rosecrans' plan was to attack the Confederate uh, left. Uh, unfortunately for us, Bragg's intention was to attack attack our left. And also, unfortunately, Bragg had attacked first. It was a surprise attack early in the morning. Now, I was used to having my troops get up at the break of dawn, uh, or actually before dawn, uh, to have uh, breakfast and get ready uh, for battle. And I did that here at, at Stones River. And we were in a position that when the Confederates made their surprise attack, that they virtually rolled up our line up till they reached my line. And we held them off for several hours, um, falling back slowly in the process. And until Rosecrans was able to rally the rest of the troops and form a very strong defensive line. The Confederates were wanting to cut us off um, at the Nashville Chattanooga Railroad and off, also at the Nashville Turnpike. So we had uh, held them off uh, and until the Confederates had retired. So that was a, uh, a very good victory for us. And so then we began our move towards Chattanooga from that point. We uh, went on our uh, Tullahoma campaign in which we outmaneuvered Bragg and occupied the town of Tullahoma, and then began to move on to and towards Chattanooga. Once again, we outmaneuvered him and obtained the railheads at Chattanooga. But unfortunately, um, unbeknownst to, to us, we didn't quite know that Longstreet had come in from uh, the Eastern Theater and reinforced Bragg. Uh, in our line of uh, defense, Rosecrans got some uh, misinformation. He was informed that one of his divisions uh, was pulled off of the line and that there was a gap in the line. Now, that was not accurate. So Rosecrans had moved the division that was next to, to me in line and pulled that division away. That movement actually did create a gap in the line. And when the fighting began, Longstreet took full advantage of that gap and poured through that gap, uh, cutting us uh, off, us meaning my division. Um, a lot of my division began to uh, be routed. I pulled back to a hill, Lytle Hill. Uh, we did a uh, stand there, but <clears throat> we were just overrun with our own troops who were. Uh, being routed, and so we pulled back even further. I had gotten orders from my commander, Alexander McCook, to report to or to head towards Rossville, 
And, uh, but I also got word that General Thomas was looking for assistance because he was being assaulted at Snod Hill, uh, Snodgrass Hill, sorry. So I met with uh, three division commanders, uh, Jefferson Davis, uh, the Union Jefferson Davis, uh, James Negley and myself, and we met and we decided that I would go on to uh, Rossville, but to aid um, Thomas uh, while uh, Davis would remain behind and cover our retreat. And Negley would also go to Rossville and help uh, as a reserve uh, anywhere that he could. So I had to take a, an arcing movement to get to Thomas. Uh, unfortunately, uh, where he needed help was on his right, but the way I went uh, ended up getting me on his left. And by the time I got there, darkness had already set in and the fighting had, had um, virtually ended at that point. Um, so, Thomas and I then withdrew and we went to Chattanooga back with where Rosecrans had already been as well as my core commander uh, to um, ending a pretty significant defeat for the Union at Chickamauga. And in my his history of, uh, of fighting was one of the worst in my career. Uh, so we were in Chattanooga. Uh, the Confederates tried to besiege us there. And uh, at that point in time is when General Grant was made commander of all the Union armies. Uh, he came into Chattanooga and eventually we uh, broke out. And um, when we did, we confronted uh, the Confederates uh, who were to the south of us at places called Lookout Mountain and Missionary Ridge. The initial plan for that action was to have Sherman attack uh, the north end of Missionary Ridge and Hooker attack the southern end uh, at Lookout Mountain. Hooker was uh, successful in pushing off the Confederates uh, and pushed them onto Missionary Ridge. Unfortunately, Sherman had some poor intelligence and he didn't end up where he was supposed to. He ended up at a place called Billy Goat Hill. So uh, we had to uh, plan another uh, attack. And this time Sherman was to again attack the north end of Missionary Ridge and Hooker at the southern end. Um, unfortunately for Sherman, uh, he uh, encountered a very strong Confederate defense and was uh, pushed back. Hooker had a little bit more success. So Grant wanted um, Thomas's corps to attack the middle and relieve Sherman so that he can resume his attack. Our orders were, at least my order, was to take the rifle pits at the base of Missionary Ridge. We um, approached the ridge uh, at the base and uh, with hand-to-hand -hand fighting, uh, overcame the Confederate line there and now occupied the rifle pits at the base. However, there were still rifle uh, pits uh, at the military crest of Missionary Ridge that were shooting down upon us. We were told originally to stop at the base, but with the firing down on us and the cannon that was on top of Missionary Ridge firing on us. Um, we felt that we were in a very tenuous position. And without any orders, my men, as well as my uh, the division to my left, uh, began scrambling up the hill, um, primarily to get out of the, uh, the sights of, uh, of the Confederate guns. And as we, and we began scrambling up, I was about halfway up when a cannon shell hit in front of me and um, began to kick dirt up in my face. I turned to my aide and I said, you have that flask of whiskey with you. 
He said, yes. So he handed it to me and I opened it up and I held it up at the guns up at the top of Missionary Ridge. And I said, that was very disingenuous of you. I said, I shall take those guns for that. And I toasted him. And with that, we kept scrambling up the hill and overcame the rifle pits at the crest and eventually made it to the very top along with Wood's division. And we captured all of the Confederate cannon that was at the, at the top of the ridge, including Bragg's headquarters. I also absconded with John Breckenridge's horse, a very fine horse. I added him to my collection along with my primary horse that was named uh, Rienzi, uh, given to me after the Battle of Boonville, uh, named after the town nearby. So I, ha I named uh, Breckenridge's horse Breckenridge. Not a lot of thought behind that, but uh, it worked. We uh, chased the Confederates for about two miles before I was uh, called back. And, um, and then we returned back to Chattanooga, where General Grant around that time was given the orders to um, return east. And when he did, it was apparent to him and General Halleck, um, Mr. Stanton, as well as Abraham Lincoln, that the Confederate, I mean, I'm sorry, the cavalry in uh, the east wasn't doing as well as they would have expected them to. Even um, Mr. Lincoln had said, whoever saw a dead cavalryman. I was hoping that he was just in jest at that point. So I received orders to uh, come east and take control of the cavalry corps in the Army of the Potomac. I found out that I was not the first choice. William Franklin was Grant's first choice. Uh, however, they thought it best uh, to pick someone else and that someone else ended up being me. Uh, now, this is the third time in my lifetime that um, I was not the first choice. I wasn't the first choice at West Point uh, as an appointee. I wasn't the first choice at that Ohio uh, regiment. Now I wasn't the first choice to take over the uh, Cavalry Corps. I was beginning to get a little uh, uh, complex there. Anyway, however, it worked out and I took control of the Cavalry Corps. I uh, looked over the uh, condition of the horses and the first thing that I realized was how poor the horses uh, were in uh, and primarily because of extensive duty uh, picketing and uh, screening and primarily overuse of the horses. So I gave the men two weeks to clean up their act, uh, feed and groom the horses, get back to doing what they were supposed to do to care for the horses. And it took about two weeks to get the horses back in fighting shape again. And was under the command of General George Meade, who was the commander of the Army of the Potomac, However, he didn't see eye to eye, and he and I didn't see eye to eye with how cavalry should be conducted. And I wanted the cavalry to be a concentrated offensive fighting force, very similar to how the Confederates utilized their cavalry. However, Meade, being older than me, um, he was used to the traditional use of cavalry, using them for picketing, screening, guarding wagons. And I felt that that was a waste. I felt the infantry can do a lot of that. Uh, the cavalry can be a, a premier fighting force if only I was allowed to, to make it that. So me didn't like my ideas. And so uh, he, he ignored me for the most part. Uh, what he really wanted was someone who 
was a staff member who he can give orders to, and then in turn give orders down to the cavalry division commanders. And I wasn't one for being a staff officer. I mean, I did that under Halleck. Um, and from that point to this point, I was not going to go back to being just a staff officer. General Grant formulated a plan called the Overland Campaign to move towards uh, Richmond. And the first um, engagement was at an ungodly place called the Wilderness. Uh, this place was so wooded and, and uh, it, this was not a good place for any cavalry actions. <clears throat> so my task was to assign the cavalry to lead the army across the Rapidan. Um, two, two of my divisions did that. James Wilson's division crossed at Germania Ford and um, David McMurphy Gregg's division crossed at Eli's Ford. <clears throat> uh, Alfred Torbett was my other division commander and uh, he remained behind to guard the wagons, just like General Meade wanted. Anyway, I had given orders to Wilson to go as far as Parker's store at the Wilderness Tavern. However, General Meade had had contradicted my orders and gave him an order to send a brigade out uh, further toward Craig's meeting house, and uh, which Wilson did, and Wilson accompanied that brigade. Um, when they set out, the rest of his uh, division had bivouac for the, for the night. In the morning, his brigade out at the meeting house encountered Rosser's Confederates and um, had a sharp fight uh, there um, and was, uh, had pulled back um, uh, a short distance. <clears throat> but Wilson realized that he hadn't heard any word from the Fifth Corps who was supposed to be behind him. He was leading uh, the Fifth Corps initially and he hadn't heard, word, heard any word from him. And he felt that he was in a two precarious position. So he decided to pull his uh, outmost brigade back to the original position at Parker's store. However, by the time he got there, he realized the Confederates had got her into and around his rear and separated his line of communication between him and me. So he managed to extricate himself and pulled back to Todd's Tavern. And I had sent Greg's division to reinforce Wilson at Todd's Tavern. Greg arrived and the two divisions were holding off the Confederates very handily at that point. However, I got word from General Meade, which was misinformation that the Confederates got around Hancock's flank and into his rear. So he, he suggested that I pull my cavalry back and uh, to guard the wagons, which I did, thus ending any fighting in, uh, for the cavalry at the wilderness. Um, the next stop was then going to be towards Spotsylvania. Grant, unlike any of the other former Eastern theater commanders, well, did not want to pull back and, and uh, just rest on us laurels. Instead, he leapfrogged uh, down uh, to the next spot uh, in a direction heading towards Richmond. The next place was going to be Spotsylvania. Once again, my cavalry was out into the lead. I gave um, a merit. Uh, and Greg orders to um, obtain and control Snell Bridge over the Po River and James to occupy Spotsylvania, which he did. Once again, George Meade meddled with my orders and counter uh, ordered uh, Greg and Merritt and told them to lead the army in um, Merritt leading the 
V Corps on the road towards Spotsylvania. Unfortunately, <clears throat> Confederates now occupied that road and um, caused the cavalry to halt uh, and fight the Confederates. And that halting had, had caused the V Corps to smash into the cavalry and intermingle the cavalry along the road and created a, a bottleneck there. In the meantime, the Confederates got to Spotsylvania and um, pushed Wilson's division out of town, and they now occupied Spotsylvania. I maintain that had Meade not given any counter orders to Gregg and Merritt, and it, had they originally uh, stayed at the Snell Bridge where uh, I originally ordered them to, the Confederates wouldn't have been able to cross there and get to Spotsylvania. So shortly after Spotsylvania, Meade criticized my cavalry, saying that they prevented uh, the infantry from reaching Spotsylvania, that they couldn't clear the road. And I just, my Irish temper was set off. And I know that General Meade's temper was just as uh, uh, hair triggered as myself. And we began a very heated argument with expletives flying in every direction. And I resented him meddling in my cavalry. He didn't understand cavalry and told him in no uncertain words that if he wanted to command the cavalry that he could, that I was not going to give another order and that I could whip Stuart if only he let me. So he stormed off and he went to complain to Grant about me. And he managed to mention to Grant that I said that I could whip Stuart. Grant said, did he really say that? And Meade said, yes, he did. And Grant said, well, he generally knows what he's speaking about. Go let him do it. So the next thing I knew, I was receiving orders <clears throat> for independent command of the cavalry. So I decided to take my entire cavalry corps on a raid towards Richmond. My goals for this raid was to disrupt communication, to draw the, the Confederate cavalry away from Grant, and to tear up any uh, uh, roadway, uh, railroad ways and, and destroy as much supplies as we could. So we did set off, and just as I thought, the Confederate cavalry followed us. And um, at a place called Yellow Tavern, we encountered the Confederates and began a, uh, a fight there. Uh, the Confederates were pushing us back and uh, pushed us back uh, at a point where the leadership of the cavalry, uh, i.e., uh, Jeb Stewart, uh, got himself so far forward that he uh, got into retreating troopers. So one of the troopers noticed him and noticed who he was, pulled out his revolver and shot him square in the stomach, mortally wounding the general. Um, the trooper's name was uh, John Huff from the 5th Michigan who unfortunately was killed in action several weeks later. However, um, the killing of Stuart was not one of my goals, but uh, it was something that I could show uh, General Meade and General Brandt that I was able to do what I said I was going to do. We managed to get back to General Grant, and the results of that raid was that we destroyed a number of railroad cars, uh, 
uh, containing uh, supplies, but primarily food and medical supplies. Uh, we had destroyed communication lines. We captured about 300 Confederates. And as a bonus, we uh, rescued about 400 captured uh, Union soldiers from the Wilderness and Spotsylvania battles. So I felt that that raid uh, was a success. I did reach the outskirts of Richmond. My intention was never to enter Richmond. I didn't think I had enough uh, manpower to do such a thing or to sustain it, even if I were successful at it. <clears throat> uh, so uh, I became uh, uh, confident even more so in the fact that the cavalry as a concentrated force uh, could very well be an offensive fighting force. And we showed that at this raid. <clears throat> Not long after that, General Grant had uh, given me orders to uh, go on another raid uh, towards Trevelyan Station. The goal there was to uh, <clears throat> destroy the Virginia Central Railroad and the James River Canal. He uh, then said that I was to meet up with David Hunter at Charlottesville and then uh, return back to the Army of the Potomac at Petersburg. Uh, I set forth to do that. Uh, the other goal of that raid was to pull the cavalry away from Grant as Grant wanted to make a move to cross the James River. So, we uh, had pulled away. We managed to draw away the, con the Confederate cavalry. We had <clears throat> a very sharp fight at Trevelyan Station, pushed the Confederates back. But in the process, General Custer, uh, who managed to capture, get into the rear of the Confederates, captured uh, Wade Hampton's um, baggage train, um, got separated, and he was surrounded himself. He managed to extricate himself from that, and uh, the next day we wanted to uh, confront the Confederates at an intersection of the roads that lead to Charlottesville. Uh, we tried several attempts to, um, to break them, but they uh, were very uh, tough in their defense and uh, held strong. However, we had some captured Confederates who said that David Hunter wasn't heading to Charlottesville, he was heading towards Lynchburg. So I felt that there was no need to continue on to Charlottesville at that point and turn my cavalry back, uh, to head back to Grant, but taking my time doing so because I knew that the Confederate cavalry was trailing me and the longer that I was away from Grant, the longer the Confederate cavalry was away. So I, to me, the Trevelyan Station uh, engagement was a successful one its primary goal being to, to draw the Confederate cavalry away from Grant's actions. Not long after that, Confederate General Jubal Early had started some trouble. Um, he went up through the Shenandoah Valley. Um, his aim was to head towards Washington City and attack the city. He had a, uh, a fight at Monocacy in uh, Maryland, where uh, he defeated the Union troops there, uh, but did not do anything further uh, in his approach to Washington. Uh, during that time, he also had sent his cavalry up into Pennsylvania, uh, where they burned the town of Chambersburg. So uh, Lincoln and Grant felt that he was a thorn in their side, and wanted someone to take care of him and, and remove his, his uh, army from the Shenandoah Valley. Um, but there were too many uh, military districts that, and departments that intermingled with one another for such an action. So he decided to form the Middle Military District, which would be in command of a variety of departments. Um, and that way it can control all of these departments. Uh, I ended up getting that command, but once again, I was not the first pick. 
Uh, Grant, uh, again, wanted uh, Franklin. Um, he also uh, suggested Meade, uh, but they decided actually on David Hunter. But David Hunter would only be the command of the district uh, uh, in, in title only. Uh, I was to be commander in the field. And Hunter felt that that was too much bureaucracy and declined the position. So the position uh, fell to me. And so as part of this, uh, I was given command of um, several infantry corps as well as my uh, cavalry corps. Um, and not only was our goal to remove early from the Shenandoah Valley, but also to destroy the valley of food supplies for the Confederates. The valley for the uh, pre previous three years has been used as a breadbasket for the Confederate Army, <clears throat> and therefore um, it had to be it had to be destroyed. Um, so there were three primary battles at the, in the Shenandoah. The first at Winchester, the second at Fisher's Hill, and the third one at Cedar Creek. All were Union victories. Um, in between Fisher's Hill and Cedar Creek, we managed to burn uh, the valley down, destroying uh, many crops, destroying thousands of barns. We destroyed mills, and we took as much livestock as we could consume with us. Uh, Grant had mentioned that he he wanted it so much devastated that crow flying across it for the season would have to carry its own provender. And thus we did accomplish that. So upon my return from the valley, um, Grant assigned me to their left flank with the intention to try to get into the Confederate rear and um, capture the South Side Railroad. Uh, we, we went on that uh, expedition, uh, but got stopped at Dinwiddie Port and um, encountered Pickett's infantry there. And we fought them off uh, until nightfall, uh, but I couldn't hold on very long. <clears throat> so I requested some reinforcements. Grant then sent the Fifth Corps under General Governor Warren to reinforce me. However, uh, he didn't come when he was supposed to come. Uh, and uh, uh, if he had come when he was supposed to come, he would have cut off Pickett and we would have captured or destroyed all of Pickett's army. Unfortunately, Pickett pulled back and Warren didn't appear until sometime in. Uh, mid-morning. And so we formed our plan of action and went into battle at a place called Five Forks, which was an intersection. Uh, the Confederates wanted to defend that because those roads led to the South Side Railroad. Uh, we were very successful and victorious at Five Forks, which caused my cavalry to get in around the flank of the Confederates. And in doing so, Lee sent reinforcements away from his works at Petersburg, causing his line to weaken. And at that point, Grant gave the orders for an all out attack. That all out, out attack caused the breach at Petersburg and the ultimate uh, uh, retreat of the Confederates, including. Uh, the president of Confederacy and retreating out of Richmond. Um, my cavalry shadowed the Confederates south uh, of their line and, and their path, intercepting them along the way, destroying rail cars of supplies. And until we reached a point at a place called Appomattox Station, where there were two rail cars of supplies and artillery. Uh, General Custer arrived first and surprised them. He managed to uh, 
defeat the artillerists that were there and burn the two railroad cars. And now we occupied the station. This ultimately resulted in Lee uh, capitulating uh, his army and signing a surrender at Appomattox Courthouse, thus ending the war. So that sums up my brief history of myself from Albany to Appomattox. And I thank you for your attention. Have a good evening.